Um, as Kirsty mentioned, I'm the organiser of Free Software Melbourne. Uh, I also organise the annual Software Freedom Day in Melbourne. Um, and I'm a civic hacker and a free software advocate. Um, so we'll have a look at the, the nuts and bolts of uh, some actual licences and how the mechanics of them work and why it might matter for you to license your software projects uh, in a certain way or be selective about the software, the, the licensing of software you use. Um, sort of as Koji mentioned, like just being supportive of and using free software uh, can help encourage that kind of behaviour in, uh, in others. Um, so the first uh, nasty term to, to pull apart to understand software licensing is intellectual property. Um, and this is a, a grab bag of lots of different legal uh, fields. So intellectual property isn't a, a single legal field, it's a conglomeration of many different ones. And which fields are included and not included can depend on the jurisdiction or the country. Um, but for Australia, um, we have, uh, or well, almost every jurisdiction has copyright, trademark, and patent law uh, under the umbrella of intellectual property. Um, and in Australia, we also include uh, designs and uh, plant breeding rights, of all things. There are big five intellectual property rights in Australia. Um, but copyright's the, the main one we'll be focused on. There is some overlap. So uh, Trademark has a pretty famous example uh, with Firefox, which uh, I won't have to explain now that <laughs> uh, Koji's already been talking about it. Um, there was an issue where uh, Mozilla, the company who makes Firefox, had to enforce their trademark uh, even against people who that they wanted to cooperate with. Uh, so for a while, uh, Linux distributions had to distribute a program called Ice Weasel, which was Firefox with a different logo and a different name. And that was so that they could protect their trademark, because if they let some people get away with it, then they lose their right to enforce trademark. So sometimes software licensing overlaps. Uh, Mozilla updated their most recent license to make exceptions for this case. So. Uh, now Firefox can be packaged as usual. Um, but generally, uh, copyright is the, uh, the part of law we're going to be interested in. Um, and unfortunately, again, copyright is a, a legal thing that's made up by each country and each jurisdiction. So uh, the rules could vary from place to place. Um, but in general, for Australia, uh, we have automatic assignment of cop copyright, so there's no extra action you have to perform. As soon as you create an artistic or a digital or a, a program, a, a digital work, uh, copyright is assigned to you, the author, immediately, automatically. Um, and the duration of copyright in Australia is generally uh, 70 years plus life. There are some uh, exceptions to that, but for for most uh, purposes, 70 years plus, plus life. Um, and, and this automatic assignment of copyright to the owner is exclusive use and distribution. So if I don't uh, do anything else uh, after I've created a piece of software, no one else on the planet is allowed to use uh, or read or uh, compile or run the program. Um, to some degree, publishing it on a place like GitHub uh, implies that there's a license for you to read it because I'm publishing it in a, in a well-known place. But there's no, imp there's no such implication that you should be allowed to run it or compile it. So this is why software licensing is important uh, and comes to the rescue, at least for open source projects, there's a, a handy solution for us. Um, so, as I mentioned, they use uh, copyright law and explicitly grant rights to users that would other be otherwise be denied by that blanket exception. Um, so they can quite selectively grant or deny specific rights um, or conditions on their users. And along with rights, they can also impose responsibilities on their users. So this is why uh, some licenses will get the, the term viral applied to them because they impose a restriction on you that uh, forces you to impose restrictions on people further along the chain. So there's this sort of contagious or viral nature to it. Um, 
uh, we'll get into why that what, that's the case. Um, and uh, the, the software license is simply defined by being written down. So you don't have to be a lawyer to create a software license. Um, you, whatever you write in a license file is now a software license. Um, but please don't, because uh, one of the biggest problems in software licensing is license proliferation. Mm. Uh, the fact that there are already thousands, if not tens of thousands, of software licenses out there. Um, and one of them probably fits your bill, and so writing your own license uh, just introduces uncertainty. Uh, a classic case of this, which is uh, rather entertaining, is the JSON data format. Uh, data formats aren't super exciting, but this data format made itself exciting by having in its license contract a license, a clause stating that the software must be used for good and not for evil. That sounds like a, a laudable goal, uh, but uh, the legal and, and, and the author has stated publicly many times that he would never consider enforcing this clause. Still, uh, companies and individuals have refused to adopt the license um, because of the legal uncertainty around that term. Maybe the project will be adopted by someone who's much less benign in the future. There's no way we can guarantee that won't happen. Uh, and there's no way that, that we can guarantee that they won't convince a, a, a court that what you've done is, is evil. Um, so, you know, just introducing fun little clauses can cause uncertainty and stop people getting involved in your project. Um, so sticking to one of the major licenses we'll sort of talk about today um, is, is just good for community involvement in your project, if nothing else. Um, so now that you barely know what a software license is, we'll talk about dual licensing. Um, this is mainly just because it clears up a few sort of side issues. Um, so as the author of a software, I can license it as I wish, and I can re-license it as I wish, and I can license it three times at the same time, all incompatible licenses, and that is totally fine, because I'm the copyright holder. Now, all of those versions will start, will legally exist as independent entities. Um, so the most common result in this is a dual open source and proprietary licensing. Um, this is very common amongst developer tools, maybe something you haven't really come across. Um, but uh, Oracle is, is probably one of the biggest users of this kind of license and, and most famous. Uh, where they have a MySQL Community Edition and a MySQL Enterprise Edition. And there are a few little bits of secret source in the Enterprise Edition, but fundamentally they're the same source code uh, and licensed under completely incompatible licenses. One of which is bought and is closed source, one of which is given away and is open source and controlled by the community for the most part. Um, so yeah, so this is just to point out that the, uh, the actual owner of the copyright can pretty much do whatever they want, um, but then as users of software, we only get to take what license we've been able to, to get the software with. So I can't have the open source license for SQL Server acquire an enterprise version of SQL Server and think I'm okay running it. Uh, they are considered two separate legal entities and not at all the same thing under law uh, anymore. So, uh, and yeah, this can also cause friction with getting people into a project where you have to get explicit permission from people to uh, allow re-licensing of software. And so this can result in having to have uh, an agreement when you start contributing to the, to the project. Um, so yeah, this kind of dual licensing probably isn't the kind of thing you want, um, but yeah, it's just there to highlight the uniqueness of uh, your power as an author. Um, so if we look at, we can look at licenses in a lot of different ways. Um, we can kind of just split all licenses into permissive and restrictive. So this is a, just a subset of licenses, which ones they are aren't, aren't hugely important. But we can just say, put a line down the middle, all these licenses are permissive, all these licenses are restrictive. Um, and so the, the permissive licenses are characterized by very minimal restrictions uh, on anyone at all and very minimal in size. 
Um, and these espouse the open source principles. I'm glad I don't have to go into open source versus free software if you were all here for the last session. Um, so these minimalist licenses are the open source um, licenses. Uh, and if we break it down, and then there's uh, the restrictive licenses, which take the more user-centric and community-centric approach. Uh, and actually impose restrictions on developers and distributors designed to protect <coughs> users. So, um, to make it a little bit more nuanced, we can break up the groups into, into four sort of groups, uh, which are the MIT BSD permissive licenses, uh, the Apache license, licenses, and then the protective licenses, and a fourth category of all the other thousands of licenses that could be anywhere on the spectrum. Um, but generally, even the unique licenses are based on an existing license in this paradigm. And so if you know these, uh, the, I suppose, the, the three main families of the MIT, uh, the second group of, of GPL, and the Apache style licenses, you'll have a good framework for understanding any software license you come across. Um, <coughs> So yeah, and then there are sort of the uh, the Apache licenses we won't go into today because that's a, a humongous topic by itself. This is another crossover of in intellectual property where uh, that, that style of license tends to address patents um, and issues to do with standardization. So uh, it might be an important license if you're trying to create a technology that forms a, a platform for other people to use. Um, but yeah, it is fairly specialist and uh, would require a 40-minute session on its own. Um, so we'll ignore Apache and just focus on the GPL and the MIT licenses to give you an idea of the kind of licenses everything else will be based on. Um, and then in the, in the sort of niche and quirky uh, areas, there are licenses such as the Do What You Want license, the Buy Me A Beer license, the pay what you want license, the send me a postcard license, uh, so ranging from useful to hilarious. Um, on the more useful end of the spectrum are uh, the careware and donationware licenses, um, which are designed to, like if your project is not accepting funds but you want to direct them towards a charitable organisation, these licenses are built for that. So uh, they're also a good example of if you have an idea, there's already a license. In fact, there's already two careware and donationware that pretty much do the same thing. Um, but obviously, whoever wrote donationware didn't know about careware, and so just penned their own license. And now we have two of them to deal with. <laughs> so uh, a bit of research on if, if you have some particular idea of what you want to achieve, um, and you think, ah, oh, no one will have done that, you're probably wrong. Someone probably has done it. Um, so the MIT license uh, is one of the permissive ones, which, uh, as I mentioned, are quite short. It's uh, 168 words. It's five minutes worth of reading. It's all pretty clear English. So uh, this is a license, I don't, if you're interested in this sort of thing, I highly recommend having read it. Um, it doesn't take long. It's really easy to understand. Um, and the few restrictions it does have are just keeping the uh, author and the copyright assignment clear and keeping a copy of the license with the work. Um, and then uh, effectively, yeah, you do what you want <laughs> with the rest of it. Um, because of its simplicity and shortness, uh, the MIT license is, is uh, the basis of a lot of derivative licenses. Um, so just knowing this license will have you know about over 50% of all the licenses in the world. Uh, there'll be an MIT license with some extra clause tacked on the end. Um, and uh, one of the advantages of the MIT license is that you could, there are so few restrictions, you can use this software in a proprietary project um, without any issues. Um, and a, an example of the flavor of variance you'll get um, is the BSD license is uh, often compared as a, a, an equal to the MIT license. Um, and its uh, little niche area is that it, it has clauses in it about um, 
whether your project can be used in advertising material for another project. So um, as opposed to an MIT license project, if I imported some uh, BSD license project, I couldn't then brag in my advertising material that I'm using this project. Cool. Um, so let's move on to the GPL. This is one of the more restrictive licenses. Um, and as Koji thankfully also explained, focuses on, on user freedoms and not free cost. Um, it is perfectly, it used to actually be a common practice to sell CDs with Linux on it. Um, back in the day when downloading things cost money. Um, it was very common to actually sell CDs. And what you were selling was the CD and giving away the software. But, um, but there's no restriction on, on money and, and the GPL. Um, the GPL is a lot wordier. It's over 5,000 words, the most recent version, and you can tell it's written by lawyers. Um, it's not an easy document to read through. Um, some of the older versions are reasonably easy, um, but still not a five minute kind of read through like the MIT licenses are. Um, but yeah, all of these words are, are focused on preserving those four freedoms. Uh, Koji mentioned the, uh, the right to study, run, modify, and redistribute the software. Um, whereas open source really only protects the study and arguably the run uh, aspects of software. So uh, I suppose uh, the Android example is a good example where yes they have published the source code but trying to get it running is a week's worth of work if, you, if you're trying to do it yourself. So, um, so uh, yeah free software all of these words are focused on preserving these rights going forwards. Um, and so that last uh, term, redistribute, is where a lot of the responsibilities are imposed on you as a developer. Um, if you take a GPL project and modify it and then distribute it, you are now required to preserve those four freedoms going forwards for all users. Um, so this is why a lot of people, uh, a lot of developers don't like the GPL because it imposes restrictions on them. Um, but these restrictions are so that the community and users are free from the tyranny of the software developer. Um, and, and we are terrible. <laughs> um, so a couple of variants of the GPL um, uh, at quite drastically different ends of, of variants on the GPL are the lesser GPL, um, which allows the project unmodified to be included into a proprietary project. Um, so this was seen as a bit of a best of both worlds. You can get the corporate adoption of the MIT license of, of companies will use this in a, in a proprietary project. Um, but you also get the preservation of the four freedoms for the project as a whole. Um, and the, uh, the Afero GPL uh, is almost the exact opposite. Um, it was created when uh, project uh, managers were concerned that their project was being, for example, hosted in a cloud service, and the cloud service was uh, responding with data, and they were saying, well, we haven't distributed the, the service to the people. We've hosted the service on our own, and we've just <laughs> distributed the results. And so the Afero GPL redefines distribution as any kind of network access, um, so that uh, just hosting the project in a cloud doesn't stop you from being responsible for preserving those freedoms. Um, and uh, not strictly a software license, but I'd be remiss if I didn't mention the Creative Commons licenses. Um, like the free software licenses, these uh, circumvent the automatic assignment of copyright. Uh, to grant use, modification, and development of projects such as translations, remixing, or inclusion in other works. Um, and it has some standardized restrictions that, you know, you barely have to be able to read English to be able to tell that a little person of by is, you've got to keep the attribution of who this was by, and uh, no dollars, non-commercial. Uh, Maybe the, mod the derivatives, non-derivatives, an equal sign isn't so, so clear. But it's very easy to state in a way that uh, everyone can easily understand what their rights are with this work. Um, 
the main reason to mention it uh, is that the software licenses we've discussed earlier are completely inappropriate for any kind of artwork or documents. Um, if, we, if we look at even the, the ultra permissive MIT license, it requires you to keep a copy of the license with the work. So if someone had an image and they had uh, licensed it as MIT, and I wanted to reuse that image in another image, technically I would have to somehow include the license in there. And if I printed out that image and started distributing it around, technically I should be printing out all of the licenses for all of the images in there and distributing that with every copy of the image. So uh, software licenses shouldn't be used for art and, and likewise the Creative Commons shouldn't be used for, for software. But they, are, they very often overlap. If you're licensing your software open, open source or free software, you probably want your artwork and documentation to be under the Creative Commons uh, as well. So, uh, good, I'm getting towards the end. Um, so things you might want to consider um, for your project, uh, like which license you pick is going to be highly dependent on your goals and what you're trying to achieve. Uh, are you just trying to communicate an idea? Are you trying to help people to be able to achieve something? Are you trying to enable the community to be able to uh, do something it didn't do before? Um, is it important for the community to be more in control of the project than any one individual or company? Uh, then the GPL would probably be the most appropriate license. Um, and there are some interesting case studies, if we've got time at the end, um, for how the GPL has done that. Um, uh, is, it, is it potentially beneficial to have commercial interests involved in the project um, or um, uh, inclusion in a, a, a proprietary project? Uh, in that case, one of the more permissive MIT style licenses might be up your alley. Um, and conversely, would it be ethical or unethical for a, a company to commercialise this product? Um, that might also push you one way or the other on the licensing spectrum. Um, and, or do we want to uh, have this technology form the basis of a, an interchange or, or, or a standard? In that case, um, going into the deep, deep well that is the Apache and, and patent licences uh, might be essential. So, we're just about out of time, which uh, the only slide I had left was the uh, list of tons of stuff we haven't covered. Um, so there's, there's lots of side issues on this, um, from enforcement and compatibility is a huge nightmare. Each one of these licenses has a huge list of every other license and its own opinion on them, and whether they're compatible. So. Um, and if you're just interested in general, I run Free Software Melbourne where we talk about these sort of issues. There's also the Open Source Industry Australia who are more business and government facing um, and Linux users Victoria who are more technical facing. Um, uh, and yes, I think that's about it from me. Uh, I think we've got enough time for some Q&A. For, for one Q and A, otherwise you can come and chase us, and we've got some stickers down the front if you want to come up and we chat. We take a few questions. One, one, next <laughs> one question. And